Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're happy to welcome Shayan, who will tell us about multi-way spectral partitioning. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very good to be back here. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about uh, spectral partitioning and higher order Chigurh inequalities. Uh, the main part of this talk is based on a joint work with James Lee and Luca Trefisan, but I will talk about some newer results as well. Uh, in the talk, I try to be, since, since most of the people are from theory group, I try to be not wishy-washy and give you almost the proof. So I want to talk about a K clustering problem. Uh, suppose we are given an undirected graph G uh, and an integer K. We want to find k good clusters, S1 up to Sk in the graph, k disjoint <coughs> clusters. Okay? So this graph G may represent the friendships in a social network. In that case, a good cluster would represent a, a community in a social network. Or the graph may come up from a set of data points where the edges could be weighted, and the weight of an edge would represent the similarity between data points. So in that case, a cluster in the graph would represent a cluster of the data. Okay? So in the talk, I'm going to assume that the graph is unweighted and regular for simplicity. But all of the results would generalize to non-regular and weighted graphs. Okay? Now let me tell you uh, how I'm going to measure the quality of a clustering. I'm going to use this notion of expansion to measure the quality. So suppose we have a set S of vertices. The expansion of the set is defined as the ratio of the number of edges leaving the set to the sum of the degrees of vertices in S. Okay? So because we assume the graph is deregular, the denominator is exactly d times S. Okay? For example, in this graph, the expansion of the set is one-fifth because three edges are leaving the set and summation of the vertex degrees is 50. Okay? There are other parameters to measure the quality of a cluster, such as the diameter or clustering coefficient. But mostly for these other parameters, you, you, can, you can find examples where there is a natural clustering with a bad quality. So I'm going to work with this notion of quality. The expansion parameter is always between 0 and 1. And the closer to 0 means that we have a better cluster. Okay? So, so ideally, you would like to find a clustering of a graph such that every cluster has a small expansion very close to 0. So, so to measure, this is the quality of uh, one set. To, to measure the quality of the whole clustering, I'm going to look at the maximum expansion of all of the sets. So I want to find a clustering such that the maximum expansion of all the sets is as small as possible. Okay? And our benchmark, or the optimum solution, will be the one that achieves this. It will be a clustering into k disjoint sets such that the maximum expansion is as small as possible. Okay? So I'm going to use this parameter phi of k to denote, this, to denote the optimum. Again, phi of k is the clustering into k disjoint sets such that the maximum expansion is as small as possible. They have to be non-empty, all the SIs? Uh, yes. OK. So I'm going to, next I'm going to characterize phi of k in terms of the eigenvalues of a graph. So it turns out that there is an interesting connection between the algebraic connectivity of a graph and uh, phi of 2. Okay? So let, let L be the normalized Laplacian of a graph, defined as the identity minus the adjacency matrix over the degree. It's easy to see that the Laplacian, the normalized Laplacian is a positive semi-definite matrix. The eigenvalues are non-negative. 
and moreover, there are at most two. Okay, so let lambda one be the first one, lambda two be the second one, so on. Lambda one will be always zero, and let's say they are in this increasing order. And there is a basic fact in algebraic in the spectral graph theory, which says that the number of connected components of G is exactly equal to the multiplicity of zero. Okay. What this implies is that, let's say, the spectral gap be the difference of the first and second eigenvalue, which since lambda 1 is zero, it's going to be lambda 2. This fact says that the spectral gap is zero if and only if the graph is disconnected. But on the other hand, we know that the graph is disconnected if and only if phi of 2 is 0. Because if the graph is disconnected, I can just choose my two clusters as the two connected components, and they would have expansion 0. So putting these two together, I'm going to get that the spectral gap is 0 if and only if phi of 2 is 0. In other words, by, by knowing that how the eigenvalues look, if, uh, knowing that whether or not uh, the spectral gap is zero, I can say whether or not phi of two is zero. Okay, is this clear? Now, Cheeger type inequalities provide a robust version of this fact. Meaning that phi of two is very well characterized by lambda two. It's at least one half of lambda two, it's at most root two lambda two. So, so you, sh you can think of this as following. A graph is barely connected if and only if the spectral gap is very close to zero, or lambda 2 is very close to zero. OK? The importance of this inequality is that it is independent of the size of a graph. So no matter how large G is, still you would have the same characterization of phi of 2 in terms of the eigenvalue. Okay? And the proof of this is algorithmic. It gives you a so-called spectral partitioning algorithm. I'm going to talk about it uh, later. But it's a very simple linear time algorithm to find the two clusters. Okay? Miklo conjectured that the same characterization must generalize to higher eigenvalues in the sense that we should be able to characterize phi of k in terms of lambda k without any dependency to the size of the graph. And this is the subject of this talk. Okay? I, wanna, I try to answer the question. So now let me tell you our main result. We proved that for any graph g, phi of k is at least one half of lambda k. And it's at most uh, order of k squared root lambda k. The left side of the inequality is easy. It was known before. So the main part is the right side of the inequality. Okay. Let me show you an example to understand this better. Suppose our graph is just a cycle. Okay. How, would you find, how, how would you partition a cycle into k clusters of a small expansion? The best way to do it is to just find uh, you know, k, k paths, each of length roughly n over k. Now, the expansion of each of these paths would be k over n, essentially, up to constant factors. Right? So what this means is that phi k for a cycle is k over n. But we know that lambda k for a cycle is k over n squared. So plug plugging this in above, we see that phi of k is at most root lambda k. Even you don't have any dependency to k squared. Note that this inequality answers the Miklos question because uh, although we have the dependency to k in the right hand side, this is independent of the size of a graph. Another Nice thing is that the proof is algorithmic as well. So not only we can characterize phi of k in terms of the eigenvalues, we can give an algorithm that finds a k clustering with the corresponding uh, quality. Uh, lambda k, uh, k over n squared, is that only for a small k, right? Does that hold for even k close to n, or k, k you know, bigger? Uh, 
the big O meet what's the asymptotic regime for the big O? Here or you're here? The, uh, the, the, the top one. Uh, let's see, I think. I think it holds for, for, for large eigenvalues as well, up to constant factors. But my main interest is the small case here. If k is very large, we can, this is not going to give very good uh, estimate. K can depend on it. Yeah, K can depend on it. Okay. So, is the result? K is the order n, both things are order 1. So it's K. Yeah. It's still right. yeah. Lambda is never more than 1. So. Okay. So, we can improve the dependency to k exponentially if I am allowed to use much larger eigenvalue. Instead of the lambda k, if I can use lambda 2k. Okay. I can show that phi of k is at most root lambda 2k log k. And furthermore, if the graph is in low dimension, it's like a planar graph bounded genus or doesn't have a fixed minor, then we can completely get rid of a dependency to k and show that phi of k is at most order of root lambda 2k. Are you forcing us back? Do you know that this dependency is needed? Or right, so both of these are tight. Uh, the bottom one is tight for the example I just showed you for the cycle. The middle result is tight for, for a graph called noisy hypercube, which is a generalization of the hypercube. The top result is not necessarily tight. It's still open to see if we can. It's a, I, will sh I will talk about it at the end. It's, it's interesting to see if we can improve the dependency to k, like to polylogarithmic function. Depending on some kind of uh, high criteria algorithm, but instead of bringing it to k parts, you can bring it to more, let's say, two k parts, and get like uh, better approximation or something. For you said that the top one is algorithmic, right? All of them are algorithmic. Yeah, so what is the algorithmic meaning of the second that you break into more than, let's say, 2k parts instead of k? And no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break into k parts. But uh, I'm going to use lambda 2k to measure the quality. This 2 also can be replaced by any constant greater than 1. In the post, is, is it necessary to have some dependence on k? Uh, the, in the case of k squared, can you just completely remove k squared? Is that possible or no? No, this is, I mean, as I said, the middle one is tight, right? So you have to have log k dependency. But we don't know if the dependency should be polylogarithmic or polynomial. Okay. Is there? So, so you don't know of an example where lambda k and lambda 2k differs uh, substantially? Uh, no, we can make, no, it's easy to construct graphs where lambda 2k is much larger. No, but, but it is not tight for those. Yeah. yeah. Is the result clear? Okay. So I'm going to focus mainly on the first result. And if I have time, tell you a little bit about the second two. So here is the outline of the rest of the talk. First, I'm going to give an overview of the special cases of our problem and show you how we can deal with it. Then this part will be uh, about the ideas of the proof. And lastly, I will talk about new results based on the tools and techniques that I talk about in this talk. Okay? Um, we're going to use the Rayleigh quotient as the spectral relaxation of expansion. Okay. Suppose we have a function f from the vertices to the reals. Then the Rayleigh quotient of f is defined as this ratio, the summation of f u minus f v squared over d times the summation of f u squared. Okay. To understand this, let's, let's plug in a 0, 1 function. Okay. 
if f is a zero one function, then the Rayleigh quotient is exactly the expansion of the support of f. The support of f is the those with value one. Why? Because the numerator is just the number of edges leaving the support for such f, and denominator is just d times the size of the support. I'm sorry, are you assuming the degree is constant with all this? Yeah, the degree is d. It, that's throughout, right? Yes, yep. throughout the talk, I'm yes. but. It, Everything will generalize. So, so if we could, for example, find a 0, 1 function minimizing the Rayleigh quotient, that would give us uh, the best non-expanding cut. Or in other words, it would be the Esparza's cut of a graph, which is an NP-hard problem. So we cannot do that. But this shows that why, why we think of this Rayleigh quotient as a continuous relaxation. So we cannot solve the discrete version. We will deal with the continuous relaxation. Now it turns out that we know the optimizers of this continuous relaxation, and they are the eigenfunctions or the eigenvectors of the normalized Laplacian matrix. So, for example, the one that minimizes the Rayleigh quotient is F1, and the Rayleigh quotient would be zero. So let me remind you that the first eigenvector or eigenfunction of the Laplacian is, is a constant function. And for that, the numerator would be zero. So, so R of F1 is 0, is equal to lambda 1, lambda 1, which is 0. And for any Fi, R of Fi is lambda i. So, so F1 is the function that minimizes this. F2 is the function that minimizes the Rayleigh quotient among all functions which are ortho orthogonal to F1. F3 is the one that minimizes the Rayleigh quotient among all functions that are orthogonal to F1 and F2 and so on. So in fact, F1 up to Fk gives you the best k-dimensional subspace minimizing the uh, Rayleigh quotient. So, so you, you can think of what I'm going to do, well, what I'm going to prove as a rounding algorithm, starting from this continuous relaxation of the k-clustering k problem and round it into a k-cluster. Again here, if you can again see that if F1 up to Fk was a 0 of 1 function, then this would this would be the optimal solution of our problem. Okay, so I, I, I want to talk about the rounding problem, how to start from F1 up to Fk and round them into a uh, K clustering, K disjoint sets. This is sort of minimized before the definition of the really cushion, but when you do the minimize over F, that's just give you the F1, right? Right. Okay. Now, if, if you minimize over those that are orthogonal to F1 would give you F2. Yeah, well, you've got F2, F, K, you need to have a constraint, say, yes. F1. Once yes. you find F1, and then you so constraint yes. yourself is orthogonal to the first one, right. then you'll get F2. Okay. Already for F1, you need some constraint because you didn't normalize the problem. Yeah, I just need to say the function is not all zero. There is no constraint. You mean zero or something? I mean, if you minimize over all functions f. That are not zero? You can. Then f1 would be not zero. If you, if, you add, if you add a huge constant to f, you're going to make this ratio very small. Hmm. If I. But the numerator is Think of the denominator as <coughs> just making the norm of f1, right? If you. If you take a non-constant f, but then you add to it a huge constant, you make this ratio arbitrarily small. So, so, of course. No, no, you don't make the. It's really all the same. Just. Yes. So, so if you. I mean, this is just a normalization technicality. So. No, it doesn't make make it arbitrarily small. If you add a huge constant, you just make it closer and closer to f1. Zero. Um, F1 is zero. So F1 is zero. Making it so it makes it small. smaller and smaller, but the F1 is the minimizer. Okay. okay. <laughs> so that's, it's just you counting the constant. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's, okay. but that's being orthogonal to F1, right? Okay. Right. Okay. So now let me tell you how we can do this rounding. Okay? I'm going to start with the simplest case. 
which is, so, sorry, before that, so in the rest of the talk, all I'm going to use from F1 up to Fk is that they are orthonormal and they have a small Rayleigh quotient. Okay? I, I'm not going to be interested whether or not they are eigenvectors or eigenfunctions. Okay? So now tell me, let me tell you how we can do this rounding. If F, R of F1 and R of F2 is 0, how, how can we show phi of 2 is 0? Okay? So, it follows from two observations. The first one is that if R of F is 0 for a function F, uh, then for each adjacent pair of vertices, F of U is equal to F of V, and vice versa. Why? Because just plug it in here. So what this means is that by repeated application of this, you can see that every connected component has the same value in F. Now on the other hand, I know that F1 is orthogonal to F2. So one of them is not constant. So it has at least two different values. So the graph must be disconnected. Okay. Just two observations. Now we can generalize this in two ways. One is to generalize 2 to k. Say we have k functions of zero Rayleigh quotient. How can we show phi of k is zero? And the second one is to generalize zero to some small number delta. Say r of f1 and r of f2 is less than delta. How can we show phi of 2 is less than order of root delta? So I start with the left one and then prove the right, go to the right. So again, I want to say, assume r of f1 up to r of fk is zero and show that phi of k is zero. I'm going to use a spectral embedding. Okay, this will, this will be used later. This will be used throughout the talk, so it's, uh, it's important to uh, rem remember this. So, the spectral embedding of a graph is what we get by uh, is a is an embedding of a graph in a k-dimensional space where the uh, value of each vertex f capital F of u is just F1 of u is the k-dimensional vector F1 of u, F2 of u, F2 of k of u. So here you, you see an embedding of a, of a cycle based on its three first eigenfunctions, F1, F2, F3. Okay? Remember that F1 is constant and F2 and F3 just give you the cycle. Okay? Now let's see how we can use this to prove our claim. First observation is that since all these Rayleigh quotients are zero, R of F will be zero as well. In fact, R of F is always, the Rayleigh quotient of F is always less than the maximum of the Rayleigh quotient of FI. This is very easy to see. Now what this means? Again, for any adjacent pair of vertices, they must be mapped to the same point in this high dimensional embedding. Capital X. So you're, you're also defining R for vector values. Right. That's, why the, that's why the norm was there. Right. Like earlier. And it's the L2 norm? It's the L2 2 distance of adjacent pairs over the summation of the L2 norm. Okay. So, so what this means is that each connected component of a graph is mapped to the single point in this k-dimensional embed. So to prove that phi of k is zero, I just need to say there are k points, at least, in this embed. Right? Why is that true? Again, by the orthonormality. So remember that f1 up to fk is orthonormal. Now construct, construct this matrix with rows f1 up to fk. <coughs> then the columns of this matrix will be my embedding. Okay. Now because f1 of the fk are, are orthonormal, the matrix has rank k, so there are k linearly independent columns. So there are k disjoint points in the embedding. So 
could so construct a matrix with rows f1 up to fk. These are orthonormal. So the matrix has rank k. Now look at the columns of this matrix. This is exactly the embedding. So there are k linearly independent columns, which means that there are k disjoint points in the embedding. Distinct. 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 Sorry. Distinct. Sorry. So you're just saying, in particular, linear layer independent implies distinct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So G has K connected components. Okay. Now let's see how we can prove the other generalization. Say R of F1 up and R of F2 is not zero, but say very small, some small number delta. I want to say phi of 2 is order of root delta. This is, by the way, the Cheeger inequality, right? Let me not prove it completely, just give you the idea. So first of all, since F1 and F2 are orthogonal, one of them is not constant, right? Say F2 is not constant, by what we said before. Now, because R of F2 is not zero, we cannot say adjacent vertices are mapped to the same points. But because it's a small, we can say they are mapped to close values. So the idea is to map the vertices on a line, sort them based on their values in F2. Now sweep this line from left to right and consider all the cuts and just choose the best one. This is exactly the spectral partitioning algorithm. Okay, very simple, just use it the second eigenfunction. And the intuitive idea that this works is that, you know, think of a random cut, random threshold in this region. Uh, if two points are close, the probability that it you know, cuts them is very small. But we know that the edges, the adjacent vertices are mapped to close values. So on average, we're going to cut very few number of edges. So we're going to get a sparse, a non-expanding cut. Okay. So, okay. Now our main theorem generalizes both of these special cases. We want to say if you have k functions of small values, phi of k will be a small, some polynomial of k times root delta. So by what I said so far, our proof must have two main elements. The first one is that we have to use the fact that the Rayleigh quotient of capital F is a small and argue that adjacent vertices are mapped to close points in this high dimensional embedding. To understand is look at the cycle. Okay. The second observation is that you have to use orthonormality of the vectors to argue that the embedding kind of spreads in this space. It's not concentrated in few number of places. This is what we've done in these special cases, right? So in particular, we use the first observation to choose our non-expanding sets from clusters of close points in this high dimensional embedding. And we use the second observation to argue that we can actually find k clusters, k disjoint clusters. OK? Is there any question? Taking what you mean by the mapping spreads? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, make it regress. But the intuitive idea is that it's spread in the space, right? It's not. <laughs> See the cycle. <laughs> OK. So okay, now for the next, I think, 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about the ideas of the proof. There are three main ingredients. The first one is the radial projection distance. This is a particular distance that we use in the proof. I'm going to define it in the next slide. The second one is a spreading property that we show that the vertices spread in the space with respect to this particular metric. And the last one is that we show that to prove the theorem, it is sufficient to find the regions in the space, each containing a large mass of points, such that they are well separated. We call it dense, well separated regions. Okay. 
So let me first define what I mean by radial projection metric. Uh, if you have two points, U and V, the radial projection distance is defined as follows. First, we project the points on the unit sphere around the origin. And then we compute the Euclidean distance of the projected points. Okay. So this is a Euclidean metric. Why is it useful? This helps us to reduce the problem to the simpler case where all the vertices are mapped to, uh, to the, uh, around the unit sphere. They all have the same distance to the origin. Okay? So for simplicity, the rest of the proof, you can, you can assume that this is the case. Okay, the, the vertices all have the same distance. I'll, I'll point out what, what it would uh, make uh, different if you don't assume that. Okay? Now let me tell you the proof plan. There are two main steps. The first step we find k regions in the space, x1 up to xk, such that they have 1 over k fraction of a total L2 mass, and their pairwise distance is at least 2 epsilon. What do I mean by L2 mass? L2 mass is just the summation of the norm squared of the vertices. Now, if you assume that the vertices are at the same distance to the origin, you can replace this L2 mass with the number of vertices in x. Okay, so, so think of L2 of x as a number of vertices in x. Okay. In the second step, we show that if you have k disjoint uh, regions, we can find, we can turn them into, uh, if you have k well separated regions, we can turn them into k disjoint non expanding sets, each defined on the epsilon neighborhood of one of the regions. By epsilon neighborhood, I mean the points at distance epsilon. Now, because we assume that the regions are at distance 2 epsilon, my sets will be disjoint. When you say defined on the epsilon neighborhood, you mean it's a subset of it? Yeah, the support is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the regions. The regions are not partitioning of it includes all the points, all the x's? Not necessarily. Not necessarily the points, it's like some buffer area. But then why do S1 to SK contain all the points that you will ensure? I, I'm not going to say S1. S1 up to SK will be disjoint. I'm not going to say they will get partitioning. But we can make it into a partitioning. I mean, if you have a clustering into K disjoint sets, you can make it a partitioning by just adding the remaining vertices to the largest set. So. OK, so, so we say. We have a region is dense if it has 1 over k fraction of the vertices, 1 over k fraction of the mass. And we say the regions are well separated if their distance is at least 2 epsilon. So again, the plan is to find first k dense well separated regions, then turn them into k disjoint non expanding sets. And epsilon will be a function of k. Okay? Is the plan clear? Let me start with the second step and then talk about the first step. So <clears throat> suppose we have a region that contains, let's say, 1 over k fraction of the mass. We want to round it into a non-expanding set such that the, the set is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the region. And the expansion is you know, small school root of a polynomial function of k times the Rayleigh quotient of capital F. How are we going to do that? This is essentially a generalization of uh, Chigger inequality. So the idea is to choose a random threshold in the epsilon neighborhood of x. Okay, say so we consider all these balls in the epsilon neighborhood and we choose the best one. Now, observe that each of these balls contain 1 over k fraction of a total mass. 
while on the other hand, the probability of cutting each edge is only its length over epsilon. So putting these two together proves the statement. We can show that there exists a set of expansion summation of a few minus a few over epsilon divided by one over k fraction of the mass. And by a simple application of cauchy shorts we get what? Okay. Now let me tell you how we can find k dense well separated regions. Remember that because we want to find these dense well separated regions with respect to radial projection distance, the regions would look like narrow cones around the origin. Right? Like the, the vertices in this cone that are, you know, if you have one vertex here, one vertex there, their distance would be very small, right? Because we project on the spheres, right? So, so the regions would look like this narrow cones. So let's see how we can find them. Okay? So the proof has two steps. First step is to prove the spreading property that I promised you to talk about. So the spreading property says the following. If you have a region of a small diameter, then it cannot have, of say, constant diameter, one half. It cannot have more than one over k fraction of the points. Okay, so, so in other words, think of a region of constant diameter as the sparse region. It has very few fraction of the points. So the first way we proved it. This is the diameter in the vertical projection? Yes. Okay. And but you're projecting on a sphere of radius one, so the whole space is diameter two. Yes. So when you say constant diameter, you mean constant, constant matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you cannot make this one half two, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the second step is is the following. We we use the literature on random partitioning of metric spaces to partition the space into well-separated regions covering almost all of the points. Now why this to prove the theorem? Think of the following. Suppose we, first we, suppose we apply this random partition, we get these regions that are well-separated. Now, because they have a small diameter, one half, each of them is a sparse. Each of them has a few fraction of the mass. So what we can do is to simply merge them and make them dense. Because they were originally well separated, after merging them, they are going to be well separated as well. So we're going to get k dense well separated regions. So in k, you mean just the By dense, I mean they, have, they really have 1 over k fraction. Here they have less than 1 over k fraction. I mean, if they have 1 over k, we have nothing to do. But if you have less, we merge them and make them 1 over k fraction. Okay, so let's start with the first step and see how we can prove the spreading property. So again, we want to assume that we have a region of some diameter delta. I want to show that the L2 mass inside this region is at most 1 over k, 1 minus delta squared of L2 of phi. Okay? For example, if delta is 1 half, it's going to be 4 over 3k of the total L2 mass. Okay. How are we going to prove this? Uh -huh. So this is one place that we use the radial projection distance. It is important here. Because if you don't use the radial projection distance, a region of diameter 1 half around the origin would contain almost all of the points. Because you can show that almost all of the points are on average distance root k over n from the origin. Okay, so 
So it's important to use this. How are we going to prove this? The idea is to prove the, the isotropy property. So what does this say? This says that our embedding is kind of very symmetric. It's not skewed in one direction. Okay. Mathematically, it says that for any vector z, for any unit vector z, if you project all of the points on z and take the summation of the norm squared of the projection, it is exactly 1. And this simply follows from the fact that our embedding is from an orthonormal basis. So any embedding that is from an orthonormal basis, or orthonormal set of vectors, would have this property. It's very easy to prove. OK. Now let's see how we can use this to prove the theorem. Uh, I'm going to choose my vector z to be inside my region x. Okay. Now think of delta as being very small, very close to 0. Then the, for the vertices in x, their norm and their norm after the projection are very close. Okay. So, so this sum summation of the normal square of projection will be lower bounded by L2 of x. You, have, you, you should have this delta squared loss because of like, this follows from tri trigonometric inequalities. But if delta is very small, you can essentially bound this by L2 of x. So what it says is that L2 of x is at most 1 over 1 minus delta squared. Now on the other hand, we know that L2 of v, the total mass of the vertices, is exactly k. Why? Because our embedding comes from k normal vectors. If you just sum up these things, we can rewrite them as a sum of the norm of the functions f1 up to fk and get k. Now put them together, proves the theorem, right? L2 of x is 1 over k. So again, what we prove? We prove that any region of, let's say, diameter 1 half has at most essentially 1 over k fraction of the mass, delta mass. Okay. Now, let's see how we can use this to find dense well separated regions. So, again, as I said, I want to use the random partitioning of metric spaces to partition the space into well-separated regions of constant diameter, and then we're going to merge them and get dense well-separated regions. So I start from, by, by putting a grid on the, based on the radial projection distance, such that the diameter of each cell of the grid is constant, one half. So a grid with respect to radial projection distance looks like this, right? Each of this. Then I, I shake the grid, okay? And I just, you know, delete the points that are close to the boundary, choose each set to be the points completely inside, far from the boundary. Now it's very easy to see that. If, it, if I choose epsilon to be 1 over k, each point will be far from the boundary with some constant probability. can make it very close to 1. So essentially, what this says is that I can find these regions, regions of points that, that uh, they are well separated. They have distance at least 2 epsilon. And they cover almost all of the points. Now. Since I started from the grid that have a small cell, cells of diameter 1 half, these regions will have diameter 1 half as well. So by the spreading property, they have a small mass at most 1 over k. Now I can merge them. Maybe I merge this region with this one, leave these two aside, and get 
k-dense well-separated regions. You should rotate the grid, right? Yeah, but instead of that, instead of this, let's say if you just say lock a random hyperplanes and take like a narrow band around each one. Oh, you don't want to start from a grid, or no? But then intuitively they're almost all orthogonal, so you get okay. But that relates to the previous one, not to the top of the other. But but that. that is the other way. That is different. Yeah, I know it's different, but okay. So how can I scale it? So yeah, we can. So this is the final algorithm. First, we embed the vertices based on the uh, based on the spectral embedding, the eigenfunctions. Then we then we consider a random partitioning of diameter one half, let's say, that covers almost all of the points. Almost all of the points are at distance one over k of the boundary. Then we remove the points that are close to the boundary, and just look at the regions that are completely in the interior of each cell. We merge the regions to get k-dense well-separated regions. And finally, we apply spectral rounding on each of these dense regions to get a non-expanding set under epsilon neighborhood. This algorithm that I just described is very similar to the spectral partitioning algorithm, a spectral clustering algorithm that people use in practice. This paper of Jordan, Eng, and Weiss kind of suggested this algorithm only with the difference that instead of using random partitioning, they use k-means. But they use, for example, the radial projection distance and essentially all other steps. And here is a simple application of a spectral part the nice application of spectral, spectral clustering to the uh, no uh, to, to the image applications to to, to you know uh, detect the parts of objects. So essentially, our work gives a theoretical justification for these spectral clustering algorithms. I mean, how? Right. So, so as I said, so, so, so for for the images application, you you have to start from the image and then construct a similarity graph based on how close two data are, and then. So the graph is on the elements of the image or on images. Correct. Right. Are the vertices elements of an image, or are they images? No, the vertices are elements of an image. So you start from the image and turn. So you do just one image, and this is the result of applying the same thing to each image. Yes. So you start from an image, you construct the graph, and then apply spectral clustering algorithm. But there is a very vast literature how you can start from a graph and make it, sorry, start from an image or other data structures, or other Know, context and make them into a graph. And this work, for example, is as this is very new. They they have very novel techniques on how to make these graphs. And then, uh, and somehow it's not clear that maybe we shouldn't dwell on it too long. But I mean, maybe sort of spectral partitioning is better than uh, clustering for, for this application. What do you mean? Uh, you mean spectral partitioning is the method used to cluster. Yes, but I mean maybe spectral partitioning is better than clustering so as to minimize the, the expansion. I don't know what the 
would go a bit. No, I mean, the point is, each of these, each of the parts of these objects would have a small expansion, essentially. For example, you know, look at these green areas here, right? They would have very small expansion. So, also, what if you just took a little bit of the handle? Okay, we. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, how much time was it? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. So let me uh, let me talk about uh, new results. So uh, I'm going to talk about the techniques. I'm, I'm going to talk about new results based on the techniques that I covered here. Let's zoom back a little and see what we've done. Right? We use this, part, this uh, particular embedding called the spectral embedding. This embedding is, the, is an isotropic embedding. And among the all isotropic embeddings, has a minimum energy. What do I mean by energy? The energy of the embedding is just summation of the distance squared of the adjacent pairs of vertices. Okay. So it's very easy to see that the spectral, the spectral embedding, the energy is upper bounded by k lambda k. And of course, it has the isotropic property. For any direction, the summation of inner product squared is exactly 1. For example, here we see the spectral embedding of a cycle and a hypercube. And these two properties were, the exact, were, in fact, the main properties that we used with this proof. Everything would follow from this. Now, by abstracting this out and thinking more about it, we can prove a couple of other results. Let me talk about it. This is a joint work with Quark, Lau, Lee, and Trevisan. We improved the Chigar inequality. Okay? So recall that in Chigar inequality, we say phi of 2 is at most root 2 lambda 2. Okay? We say for any graph, phi of 2 is at most order of k lambda 2 over root lambda k. I don't understand the sentence, but any graph tree and. Oh! Sorry. <laughs> no, and is a typo. <laughs> no, <I'm fine. laughs> so. And any k. And any k. Oh, right. It should be any k. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought the inequality might be part of the assumption. <laughs> So, so lambda 2 over root lambda k is always better than root lambda 2. Okay, so in particular, we can say phi of 2 is always at most lambda 2 over root lambda 3, which is always better than root lambda 2. And the constant is not huge, it's 10. <laughs> okay. So, and more interestingly, our analysis shows that the spectral partitioning algorithm, the one that just used the second eigenvector, satisfies this. You don't need to use some fancy algorithm. You can use the same spectral partitioning. And interestingly, although the algorithm doesn't know anything about higher eigenvectors, eigenfunctions, eigenvalues, anything like that, it still achieves this uh, quality. For example, it shows that if lambda k is a constant for some constant k, you get a constant factor approximation for phi of 2 or the sparse scott of the graph. And this is, in fact, happens in many applications of a spectral clustering. Okay. Uh, by using this new result and putting it together with what I've just talked about, you can even improve the results that I talked about. Instead of having bounding phi of k by root lambda k, you can bound it, upper bound it by some polynomial function of k and lambda k over root lambda l, if l is larger than k, for any l larger than k. For example, if lambda l is a constant for some, for some l greater than k, then you essentially get a very tight inequality. Or you can use it. Uh, now let me 
Well, another result. So we use the spectral embedding technique to lower bound the eigenvalues of graphs, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, or upper bound the eigenvalues of the uh, random walk matrices. We show that for any unweighted connected graph G, lambda K is at least omega of K cubed over N cubed. And if the graph is regular, it's at least omega of k squared over n squared. So the omega is an absolute constant. It's absolute constant. And, and it proves a whole new other result that I cannot cover here. Like this generalizes it to generalizes to infinite graphs, to vertex transitive graphs. You can bound many properties about uh, mixing time of random walk, return probabilities. Here is a nice algorithmic application. We can use this uh, theorem to design a al fast algorithm, a local algorithm, for approximating the number of spanning trees of a graph. Okay. Let me wrap up. So traditionally, we knew a lot about second eigenvalue, or the spectral gap. Right? We use it to analyze Markov chain. Uh, we use it to, talk, to uh, uh, give an approximation algorithm for the sparse Scott problem. You know, we use it in partitioning, clustering. But we knew very little about higher eigenvalues. So in all of the works that I talked about today, you can see that if we know about higher eigenvalues, we can improve many of these traditional results. We can provide a generalization of trigger inequality to higher eigenvalues, get a K partitioning instead of just uh, two partitioning. We can get a, even an improved trigger inequality even without changing the current algorithms. Or we can get a new framework for analyzing reversible Markov chains or uh, the mixing time of the random walks. I also said that our results give a theoretical justification for a spectral partitioning algorithms, spectral clustering algorithms uh, that use the spectral embedding uh, to, uh, to partition a graph. Okay. Here are some open problems. First one is, uh, as I said, to find the right uh, dependency on k for a f for a phi of k, for example, if it is possible to find k disjoint clusters each of expansion poly log k times root lambda k. Another interesting question is the connection of this problem, higher order chicken inequalities, to the unique games conjecture and small set expansion problem. For example, here is an open problem: if we can, if for some large k, this time it's important the k is large. So think of k as being for example, uh, n to the 1 over log log n. If it's possible to find a set much smaller than n, an expansion uh, at most order of root lambda k. So in particular, note that using our result, we can show that for any graph, there exists a set of size n over k, an expansion order of root lambda k log k. So the difference here is that you don't want the expansion to be dependent on k. So you're allowed to return a set much larger than n over k, just needed to be uh, sublinear uh, in n. But you, you don't want any dependency to k in the expansion. And this would have huge impacts for the unique games conjecture small cell expansion problem. And last thing is to analyze uh, different partitioning methods for spectral clustering, such as k-means, instead of the random partitioning that I talked about. We have some partial results for this case. For example, we can show that if lambda k plus 1 is much larger than lambda k, if you have a lar large gap between lambda k and lambda k plus 1, then the spectral embedding looks like k clouds of points. So in fact, the k-means would work. But still, we don't know a robust version of this observation. OK, and I stop here.
actually end it here till some point tomorrow. We have a full schedule, but still we can find some time. And also we have some uh, dinner today at 6.30. 6.30 plus epsilon. So anyone interested, please, please talk to me.